Welcome to the end of our journey in Disco Elysium. The thumping of the boombox heralds the end. As last time, we found the murderer and we found the Insulindian Phasmid and apparently left behind something? Left behind... Oh, the helmet! And a, a scope. Yeah, Kuno said that he kicked this helmet into the ocean. I guess the Phasmid found it. Let's see. This monstrous-looking, bug-eyed, ceramic helmet was in the Phasmid's nest. It still has some reeds sticking out of it. And it smells of seawater, but it's otherwise wearable. It's not exactly comfortable. Putting it on feels scary somehow. We get some, I got some half light. It is a battering ram and a nerf to suggestion. A fighter, not a lover. Also, uh, let's see, what is this? This was implemented. Well, I don't know if stats really mattered this much anymore. Told maybe, told maybe we should put away the boombox for the end. Get our trusty flashlight. Hello. What is it? What do you want from me? I can't go. Something is very wrong with him now. Sir, how could you not see the phasmid? It was right here. Got a picture of it and everything. See? He stares at the reeds and falls silent. Mr. Duras? The man does not respond. He keeps staring, black eyes glazed over and bulging from their sockets, his gap-toothed mouth shaking. Like an addict of some terrible substance. Wave your hand in front of his eyes. A light shiver passes him, followed by nothing. His hands are trembling and he breathes slowly. He's going into some kind of psychomotory mobility. The good news is, this solves our transportation problem, doesn't it, Mr. Dross? The trembling mouth appears to sigh. Between this and the broken tire he's used for a boat, I think it's safe to leave him here, while we go and get help. It will need to be medical first, I'm afraid. What happened to this man? Old age and shock. He looks at him, then you. I think it's the phasmid. Yes, the arrest and the appearance of the phasmid, the combined stress. But you think it's something more than that, don't you? There's much more. Remember what it said when it spoke. Quite a few things about that health check you did on him make sense now. You couldn't see it, Kim. It's just the reeds for him. That could be part of the shock. But you're right, something is off here. Mr. Dras. He touches the man's shoulder. No response. Maybe this is how that Phasmid has stayed hidden for all these years? Then how did we see it? Oh, you mean, whatever does this, does it over time? Teenagers, kids, drunks, sightings are brief, and hence not credible. But anyone who spends a long time with it... Yeah, you forget it's there. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dross, have you ever seen a stick insect pretending to be the reeds? The... the, the... The old man stutters. The doctors will have to look at this. I hope your station has better medical personnel than 57. This is a little advance for a nurse. Before, when I evaluated his state, he seemed strangely animated. He was energetic and articulate. After all these years alone, with little hygiene or medication, I would expect worse. Perhaps this animation is induced by something in the phasmid? It does not seem to be animated now it's left. Honestly, I'm ready to believe anything at this point. Maybe it is psychoactive. I mean, why not? It's three meters tall. He takes off his glasses and cleans them. When he puts them back on, he's still staring at the sea. I think he's addicted to that thing. Like a drug? He has displayed addict behavior, and not just the painkillers. His pupils appear to be dilated. They still are. He examines the catatonic man's eyes. It's definitely toxic. The phasmid. It told me it is. Told you? Yes, good. During your long staring match, I understand. 
He looks at the man, then you. He's been here for a long time. Who knows how much of it is in, in its company? He did seem distressed when it finally came to arresting him. Like he didn't want to leave this place. And the insect, maybe. He looks at his notebook. I have absolutely forgotten to take notes. I hope I remember all of this. This will be one hell of a report. Thank God we have the photo. Oh no, he hasn't been taking notes. Kim is all flustered by the appearance of the phasmid. He found some things in the phasmid's nest, Mr. Dross. He stares into the reeds. Your words don't stir anything in him. Perhaps you should... Tap the helmet on your head. Nothing. Just dull staring. Not even rage left. Wherever he is. The last embers have gone out. The war is over. If Kuno kicked it into the sea, as he said he did, the ebb would put it back here. This makes sense. Mr. Dross could have picked it up. Or the Phasmid even. If it did, this is incredible. Show him the detached scope. I... I lost... You lost it, Mr. Dross? He turns his eyes to the reeds again, as he's done so many times. Beige and white stripes. He lost the scope. Then it somehow made its way over there. With the help of a magpie phasmid. Lieutenant observes the lens sparkle in your hand. This sight is a T9, Mr. Dross. Was it attached to the rifle when you made the shot? Silence. Not even a sigh. You've gotten all you will out of this poor being. I'm going to let you rest now, Mr. Dross. The plastic cape flaps around his face in a gust of wind. His back is slouched and his mouth open. The blacks of his eyes are receding. His pupils are returning to normal. Hang tight. We should think about getting back to the mainland to get help. He'll be safe here if we don't take too long. All right. Oh, I actually didn't look at the, um, at the scope. A common 30 millimeter sniper scope, attachable to almost any bolt action 4.46 caliber, uses an older style non-dotted range finding reticle. Seaweed is still on the lens and it's suffered water damage from its time in the phasmids dowry. Anything new to say about, well, all this, Kim? Yes. Doesn't seem so. All right. I guess we're done with the conversation. And as we, we learn from Esprit de Corps, um, Harry's fellow cops have arrived and they're on the, they're on the mainland waiting for him to come back. Yes. ICM. This feels familiar somehow. Kim, what's the ICM? Insulindian Citizens Militia. It's the official name of the Communards Army. The black and white army of the revolution. Sounds an awful lot like. Sounds like RCM. Revishal Citizens Militia. It does. Why? The RCM may descend from the ICM. May? It's impossible to say. It was chaos after the war. The name was good for getting people to join us. Revash West was mostly workers and criminals. A white star? No, an upside down star. With its horns in the sky, the symbol of the commune. Are those spec stars too? No, that's the uninhabited archipelago. A DeLorean era symbol of Insulinda, known as the face in the sea. Looks old. What's it still doing here? After 44 years? That's not nearly enough to hide what happened here, Lieutenant Yefreiter. One of these barrels was still leaking fuel, as you saw. The city is full of things like this. Old bullets, guns, fuel. 
I get maybe uh, we didn't pass that encyclopedia check when we first came in, but we passed it now. All right, so the cops kind of descended from uh, the communards. In a way. By the way, what does the quest say exactly? Use the boat to return to mainland. And that's what we're doing now. The skiff is swaying on the waves by the dock. Let's return to the mainland. Let's. We are done here. The skiff rocks gently under your weight as you get in. The ride back is uneventful and quiet. You do not blast any sad tunes. But for the sound of conversation on the water, there is someone inland waiting for you. Two men and a woman stand on the concrete square of a nameless village, looking at a small yellow boat as it draws closer. The sea is calm. You reach the jetty and climb out of the skiff. Look what the tide brought in, says the man without sunglasses. Suddenly his expression changes and he tilts his head. Harry, you're bleeding all over the place. You're half dead. No one else seems bothered by the bleeding. Bothered by it? Harry, you look like you need a fucking organ transplant. You should see the other guys, eh? Huh? Kim, tell them about the other guys. They're dead now. Fuck it. Let's not get into that. Forget about all this. There's a giant... We're not forgetting about anything. Look at you. He points at you with both hands. Who are you people? Hello, I'm Trent Heilerstrom. I believe we've met on several occasions. Yeah, we did. You told me about the Wompty Dompty Dom Center. Thanks for that. That's act That was actually really helpful. I'm your goddamn partner, Jean-Vi Kumar. And this is your special task force. Or what's left of it. Special Consultant Trant Heidelstam, Patrol Officer Judith Minot. Hi. We've come to scrape what's left of you off the pavement. Lieutenant Kim Kisoragi, Prison 57. We've just come from the island where our investigation led us. We might need your help with something later. He adds, suddenly regaining his confidence. As if he recalled that he's in fact a decorated police lieutenant and not a naughty boy. That's right. We're the naughty boy. But this is clearly a departmental matter, so I'm going to leave you to discuss it among yourselves. No, Kim, you gotta have my back. Let's destroy them. <laughs> it's good to meet you, Lieutenant Kitsuhagi. She says warmly, flashing the lieutenant the tiniest of smiles. Letting the lieutenant know he shouldn't feel embarrassed over the shitstorm that's about to befall you. What's this about? Ari, we want to help you. Trant, I believe this is where you come in? Um... I don't quite know what I'm doing here. I was asked to participate as an expert. I think I need to manage your expectations a little. I'm at best an enthusiast in cognitive science. My background is in something else entirely. I engage in neurology on a merely theoretical level. In fact, I should probably get going. No, Trant. It's too late. You're part of this shit now. What have you got to say for yourself, shit kid? What does he have to say for himself? He left you to catch the bullets. Uh, well, yeah, where have you been all this time? There was a mercenary tribunal. God damn it, Harry. He shifts his weight, crosses his arms, and looks you in the eye. You told us to fuck off. You said we are cramping your style. You're detective god. Fuck everything. All will burn. Detect or die. Oh, yeah, I mean, that kind of sounds like us. Well, why would you leave a literal police god? You were crying hysterically. You were drunk, breaking things, being emotionally abusive. You said we were going into the abyss. That also sounds like us, yes. None of us wanted to see the abyss, so we fucked off. Like you told us to. 
Duped again. No one's who they say they are. Duped? Hey, here's a brilliant idea. Don't be a morbid drunk, and you won't be duped so easily. Gardener? Scav leader? This? Tell me at least you are who you said you were. Yes, I'm still Kim Kisulagi, still a lieutenant from Precinct 57. Good. That, uh, Kim is our rock. Uh, if Kim's here, then we, at least we know we have some connection to reality. Still caught up in this crossfire, too. You mentioned a task force? Yeah, major crimes unit under Lieutenant Dubois and Vicomar. Ring any bells? Refresh my memory. Who else is in this? Refresh your memory? It's a goddamn major crimes unit. There's you, me, Jude, Trunt fucking Heidelstam, and Guillaume Baby. He stares at you. I'm technically just a civilian advisor. Fuck you. You're part of this shit show. Mm, mm. First, who's Guillaume Bevy? Oh, that's an interesting story, actually. Guillaume Bevy is a police reporter who joined our team. He was really good. Then he left because he lost faith in your ability to lead the unit. Other people have left too. Good, smart people. People we won't get back. Only me and this really patient petrol officer are still here. And Trump, because I'm forcing him to stay. Okay, so what does the unit do? Do? It's a major crimes unit. We clear the desk of cases so Precinct 41 doesn't look like the worst station in town. We're shit tier now, Harry, because of you. The 41st isn't... He trails off, not wishing to finish the sentence. Yeah, I think I remember Kim saying something before that uh, the 41st actually had a good reputation. That was like real early in the game, though, I think. How did you know I was here? The cafeteria manager you fucked over told us where you went. What, guards? I mean, I thought him and I were buddies. Damn you, cafeteria manager! You betrayed me for the last time! Speaking of which, the giant aerographito in front of the building, the one that's burning, did you do that? Well, I lit it on fire. It was a poetic gesture. I knew it. Didn't I tell you, Trump? I told you it was our shit kid. The line is from Lu Jiatun's Mirova 82, isn't it? About girl child communism, the titular returning character to ghost the apparition of... Good choice, Harry. See, Trant understands. He has high conceptualization. Don't encourage him, Trant. Okay. You aren't the man with sunglasses at all. You're not even blonde. Guilty as charged. I heard you lost your mind and your memory. I wanted to see if it was true. And it was. Good work, Harry. You're insane now. There's one less person for me and everyone else to rely on. Actually, I suspected something was off. Did you? Or did you literally not recognize my face? We've been partners for how long, Harry? Don't answer that. You don't remember. I never called her a horse-faced woman. I don't actually know why we were referring to that her as that mentally. So, Trant Heidelstam turns out to be a special consultant, Trant Heidelstam. Yes, I'm Trant Heidelstam. I never said I wasn't Trant Heidelstam. Well, what are you special consulting here? What indeed? I was asked to share my take on some of the more obscure theories developed in Königstein in the 30s. Like partial psychotraumatic amnesia, group personality theory. He's here to see if you're insane. He's smart. Let's move on. You, you never told me you're not the horse-faced woman. Ah, you know, my name is not horse-faced woman. It's Judith Mino. I was assigned to your unit two months ago. I thought we were friends. We're still friends. I just have a stupid head. Okay. Because you're my commanding officer, I, I really want to respect you. I want us to have a normal relationship. And that might be rough. That will never happen, Jude. He's the rudest man on earth. 
He's the reason why the rest of us have to take sensitivity training. And I hate sensitivity training. Mm, I wouldn't say we're the rudest men on Earth. We've encountered some rude people on our way. Uh, if you want to go back to the Whirling, there's a child I could introduce you to. None of this is ringing any bells. In fact, there might not be any bells left to ring. The bells aren't ringing because you have brain damage, Detective Guard. Trant, this is where you come in. How bad is it? Well, he doesn't have visible tremors. He talks without slurring. He can drive a boat. He's standing, reasoning. All good signs, but complete retrograde amnesia. Episodic and semantic. As displayed in a station call, our interactions with him and... I don't want to be a snitch, but also mine with him before when Harry did not seem to know who I was. It's all very interesting. Interesting? Yes, interesting. I have my theories, but I would like to hear Harry's thoughts first. Harry, what do you think happened to you? Neurologically, psychologically, and why not socioeconomically? <laughs> you think I'm so poor I lost my memory? Uh, well, the second one is more accurate. We drank so much we lost our memory. We're slowly recovering it. We made it all up as a stupid joke. Well, I don't think that's true. Might have something to do with the two millimeter hole. In it. I don't think these people are ready for the two millimeter hole in reality. Highly experimental detective. This was a method we used to solve the case. I kind of doubt that's why we drank so much. Something so sad happened to me that it couldn't be me anymore. It was a defense mechanism. Well, what we were putting together was that the reason he drank and did so much drugs was to forget about the recurring dream. Uh, so saying that we drank so much that we lost our memory is accurate. Uh, but also something, something so sad happened to me I couldn't be me anymore is always is also accurate. Um, so I guess we'll go with six. Psychotraumatic amnesia? Trout? I can go for that. Shit kid is a broken man. Always has been. Who isn't? I know I am. But you know what? I keep my shit together. Also, I know a person can't wipe their own mind, however traumatic it gets. That doesn't happen. You're lying. Or insane. Or both. But Detective Vigmer, he has blanked out before. I have. Yes, a couple of times after some of the more serious benders. One was after the two drunks case, the other when we looked into that mural. Well, I can believe that this was not our first bender. We clearly were quite experienced in this. The two cases in your ledger, the unsolvable case and the new world mural, those were recent. Those cases were hard on you. Interesting. So at first he dipped his toes into it, prepared. That's where he would have gotten the idea, yes. Practice. And then he used alcohol to get there, so to speak. Practice does make perfect. What do you mean? Well, here is my theory. What if this is an absolutely normal reaction to the world we're living in? What if this is not a significant anomaly at all? Something to be explained, approached as a defect. Look at the sensory input here. He gestures toward the scenery. Look at the ruins, the neon, listen to the radio, the multitudes, the people. Live here for 40 years. As a police detective, he's like a magnetic reader on the world tape, to borrow a known metaphor. Harry's been pushed flat against it. Total input. Hardwired to the free market. He just needed for it to end. We do want the free market to end. That is part of our politics. Okay, Trump, thank you. That's absolutely meaningless. I'm glad we brought you. Will he or will he not be able to work in the major crimes unit? Is he a cretin now? I want to know that. He's not a cretin, and he is able to do work. If not in his previous leadership role, then as a line detective. Well, I mean, we are a superstar, so yeah, we're ready to lead again. Absolutely. No one even mentioned that. I misphrased my question. It should have been... Is he able to put his clothes on and use the party? Or do we need to get him on the disability pension? They can keep that pension. You're rock solid. You can put your clothes on hard. 
Damn right. Does Gene even know how many times we've changed clothes during this investigation? We could do it right now. We could take our clothes off right now. Now, nothing. Now we're just going to stand here. Really? No. Now we discuss that. What the fuck did you do to our motor carriage? Why is it there, Harry? Well, I mean, they say uh, honesty is the best policy, so... <clears throat> I drove it into the ocean when I was drunk, Gene. So refreshing. It just admits it. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for destroying 45,000 real of police property. That's coming out of everyone's payslip. <sighs> it doesn't matter. Your badge, Harry. Show me your badge. Well, uh, you, I mean, I, I have it. I don't know why you would think I wouldn't have it. In a rush to demonstrate your badge, your eager fingers can't sustain a grip on the smooth plastic, and the badge slips out of your hand. Unfortunately, our hand-eye coordination is pretty good. Plus one, we're proficient in catching small objects. We have done it before, but uh, if the chat wanted to give us a, a little bit of Motorix... Pity I'm not holding some speed, so I could just take some speed right in front of right in front of the cops. I the badge slips out of my hand, and I, in the blink of an eye, I'm taking speed and then grabbing the badge out of the air. Eighty-three percent. Not today, badge. Not today. Behold, my badge! And your gun? He asks, unimpressed by the piece of plastic in my hand. Did I ever mention that I lost the gun? I thought I kept that a secret. My gun is right here. Phew, he has it. And he didn't drop it. You're drunk like a bum, Harry. Put that thing away before you kill someone. Well, I mean... Uh, yeah, I'm drunk. I'm also on drugs, more than one. It, it really helped solving the case. Who are you buzzing for, huh? A suspect escaped, Harry. Classy is something. Because you were too high to assess a flight risk. We've read the reports. You've known Kitsuhagis. We know. We could mention the oxygen holocaust that the Phasmid talked about. I don't really think that's relevant to the current conversation. Not taking her in was the right thing to do. She gave a vital clue that led us to the island. Oh, well, if she was nice, I'm not even going to get into the other suspect who also escaped. Yeah, Ruby something. Or the fact that you're Everard Claire's little peony now, doing I don't know what for him. That's small time stuff. That's nothing. That's a humorous anecdote. Compared to the six people who were gunned down, the streets are literally red with blood, Harry. It was fucking mass murder. Yeah, but it was, like, it was also kind of badass. You have to admit. He did everything he could. We did everything we could. The company hired and vetted mercenaries. Lieutenant Dubois could between them and the locals. Here comes the cavalry. He did so at considerable risk to his own life. He was shot and survived only because of his armor. We stopped an execution, not a negotiation. The loss of life was minimal compared to what it could have been. Yeah, what he said. Thank you for the input, Lieutenant Kitsuragi. I didn't mean to suggest you didn't handle the situation. He brushes a stray strand of hair out of his eye and coughs. He thinks of apologizing, but decides against it. You spent the week with him on this case. What is your take? On um, the case? On Lieutenant Euphretor Dubois. Well, the drinking, the gun losing, also losing the badge. That's all true. Although he has not been drinking on the job this week. Uh, we ha I mean, we may have done so once, but it is true that we really haven't been drinking because that increases your fizz. And we have, we, I mean, our fizz is got it going on already, you know, not to brag, but we're pretty good in terms of fizz. See? One week. Then there's the superstardom. He likes to 
from time to time, allude to being a superstar law official. At first I thought it was a joke, but now I'm not so sure. He says disco about 20 times a day. That sounds like us. It's worrying, especially considering his political views. Detective Dubois is, as you may know, a Mazovian socio-economist. He wants to liquidate the ruling class, which, again, for a police officer, is a little odd. Well, I contain multitudes, Kim. And then there's the motor carriage in the sea. And the drugs, of course. Some kind of anti-radiation drug he uses to induce visions. But despite all this, he is a great detective. One of the best I have seen, in fact. Oh, Kim. You can use my drugs anytime. He can talk human beings into telling him everything. And he doesn't stop. In all the time I've spent with him, he has not once stopped pursuing leads, however far-fetched and tangential. He is tireless, madly driven. Well, except that one time when he stopped to sing karaoke, which, by the way, I have to disagree with you, Mr. Vikmar, was a valiant effort. He really sang his heart out. Okay, he did something. Other than that one time, he has tirelessly worked on the case, and he solved it. We have a confession, a murder weapon, and the perpetrator, locked on the island right now, awaiting transportation. He apprehended a revolutionary brigade who stayed hidden for 50 years, ever since the revolution, who's probably committed other murders over those years. Oh, and he also discovered a new species. Yeah, we're a cop and a cryptozoologist now. A new species? A colossal stick insect. It was on the island, camouflaged as a reed. It uh, unfolded from the reed. I think we may be dealing with the insulindian phasmid. He takes out the photo and shows it to the officers across the yard. Rain comes down. He covers the glossy photo of the phasmid with his hand. You hear gasps beneath the howling of the wind. As you can see, it's about three meters tall. In fact, we think it may be the largest land invertebrate ever discovered. So, as you can see, I'm a pretty okay detective and an absolutely giant communist. Fucking hell is that? Is this somehow connected to the case? He ignores you, still staring at the phasmid. Detective? Mm, yes, I believe the pheromone in emits may be responsible for the killer's mental degradation. The old man was not aware of the phasmid's presence. Exhibiting a strange, atypical dementia, he fell into a stupor after its appearance. He became near catatonic. So it is connected. I must say this is absolutely extraordinary it's i don't even have words for it yes it really does make it hard to fire out the drunk his tired eyes follow the photo as the lieutenant puts it away this is a very very sad man who has just seen something that's made him forget his sadness now you make your case now is the time now or never let's see we could mention starting the nightclub in the church Mentioning the phasmid is female. Mentioning the killer, strong motive. The previous head of the union was assassinated by our killer. We fixed the... Well, fixed. You know, it's a matter of opinion. A dead man on the boardwalk, a missing person. Looked into the mystery of the Doom commercial area. Confiscated drugs from Kuno's dad and shared them with Kuno. What do you say? Um, let's mention the killer. The killer, Lilianovich Dross. We have a strong motive for him. Lilianovich revolutionary matronym revolutionary matronym the custom started in Grad, where they have patronyms Krasovich, Larsovich, etc the revolutionaries saw this as a chauvinist activism so they used matronyms derived from the mother's name instead and Trant must have a maxed out encyclopedia this man's mother was Lillian his Lillian's son Lilianovic the custom was overturned after the revolution failed but not before it made it to Revachol. So, it is what a soldier of the ICM would be called. Thank you, Trant. Thank you for that piece of cultural theory. You said you have a motive? And that is usually our reaction to the things Encyclopedia tells us, yes. Of course, excuse me, I just thought it was noteworthy.
we were thinking it was base. Well, it was a lot of old hatred. He really wasn't intending to start a war. I don't think it was the Phasmids chemicals. Um, it, but it was, he was describing sort of feelings of jealousy. Yes. Jealousy. I thought this Lilianovich was an old man to have been hiding for 50 years, 70 something. A strange psychosexual fixation. Aggravated, possibly, by proximity to the phasmid and its chemicals. He himself gave a political reason, said he had killed an enemy combatant. Also, we have ballistics from the gun, matching the bullet found in the dead mercenary's head, and two officers on the scene that Mr. Dross confessed to. It's a clean win. It's way more than that. Perfect folding mechanism, like the phasmid. We'll win, well, we won't win us Dora back. It's a masterpiece. They'll teach this in cop school. It's all I did. Every second was a struggle. Just a little neater. It's my masterpiece. They'll teach this in cop school. Masterpiece. Get over yourself, Harry. I can still smell the booze on the wind. God damn it. Doesn't it ever leave? It is there. Like in your bones or something. Well, there's a lot of it, and it'll take a while. It will pass. In time. The previous head of the Debauders Union was assassinated by our killer. This is a conversation for when we are no longer out in the open, in Martinez, where Everhart and Edgar Claire have ears everywhere. Lieutenant lowers his voice just a little. And eyes, too. Your return from the island must not have gone unnoticed. Understood, of course. But a case against Everhart would be big. I would prefer not to partake in anything union related for political neutrality. There's a dead man on the boardwalk. A missing person I found. Yes, yes. Fallen through a gap in the boardwalk. Drunk. How did you know I found him? The body was transported to Precinct 41, our morgue. I had Tilbrook and Mullins take care of funeral arrangements and uh, family stuff. You're not the only cop in the world, Harry. This all comes back to us. Still, good work with the missing person, detective. It's still a point for you. No denying it. Well, do you want to know about the nightclub? It's a pretty cool nightclub. What was that? It sounded like you set up a nightclub in the church. Yeah, did some kids a solid. Turn their lives around. Four kids were living in a tent on the ice. They were going to drown when it melted. It's not optimal, but the building was abandoned, so he put them in there. It's okay. It's not that okay. Get off this subject now. All right, well, I guess they don't want to know about our nightclub. It's pretty cool, though. Uh, the phasmid's female, by the way. The reeds are its nest. Female? What makes you think so? You had to see it. It had the subdued colors of a female, and the nesting behavior too, I think. Incredible. Were there eggs in the nest? Not as far as I could see. There were other things there, though. I think it reproduces by parthenogenesis. As in cloning itself? <laughs> what makes you think so? <clears throat> Observation. Interesting. Then it is especially vulnerable to disease. A single strain of bacteria could wipe out the entire species. We're probably talking conservation efforts here. He looks around, quickly assessing the coast. In his mind, he's already planning a nature reserve and knows a good guy for that. He had gathered items in its nest, a helmet and a scope. Actually, you know, this would indicate it was a mate. This is far from anything in my field, but I think such nests are called bowers. They are for attracting mates. I still think it was female. Of course, as I said, I'm only guessing. I didn't see it. It must be robust if it can move a whole helmet with its limbs. I think it emits a chemical that makes it look even more like the reeds. Hmm. Yes. That would be a chiromone. A pheromone that's seemingly beneficial to the host. It usually stimulates the affected nervous system. Not a human's, of course. But perhaps a predator's? The perpetrator seemed intoxicated somehow, like an addict. It's just a hunch, but... 
There are species of bees that under the influence of chiromones take wasp larvae to their hives. Ants do the same with aphids thinking they're... Do you think this is how it stayed hidden? Nothing is off the table. But I, I want to stress this. The find does not have to be connected to the case. The case is 100% prosecutable without any chiromones. Yeah, but the case becomes so much cooler if it involves an undiscovered species, Kim. Of course, Lieutenant, of course. We should treat the case and the fast meat as completely separate from each other. People are not going to. He shakes his head. They're not going to go for this speculation in the constabulatory. It had mandibles that looked like hair, and it was completely white on the inside. Yes, but also red colored, beige and brown, a little green on the outside. After unfolding from a single stalk, it still retained parts that looked like reed tufts on its limbs. Incredible. The PR value of this is exceptional. Carp discovers new species. Maybe even discovers the Insulindian phasmid. No, no, that's too much. This would really help with some of the uh, problems we've been having. Yeah, me being a superstar cop, it would help everyone. Everyone benefits from my superstardom. Absolutely, this is great. This does not say vigilante murderers to me at all. This says science, news, human interest. You know, it's a really good thing you have that photo. Without it... He shakes his head. You're doing good here. Perhaps only for a moment, but still. Quit while you're ahead? Or no? Let's see. I don't know about bringing up the strike. I don't know if what we did um, is really something we should be, you know, spreading around. <laughs> that we were basically manipulated by Everart to tell Joyce exactly what he wanted her to know to get her to leave. So the, the strike's over technically we acted as a negotiator but realistically uh we just kind of put the situation to how everart wanted it i looked into the mystery of the doomed commercial area i don't know what a doomed commercial area is rue de saint glis lane 10 the commercial building while businesses go bankrupt i looked into it why that's not what you were supposed to do here there was a possible witness in there, and it was close to the crime scene. He was just chasing a lead and ended up advising a local shopkeeper. It was okay. Of course. Call it community outreach, right? Dodge the bullet there. For a moment, it seemed like you were just wasting time. Me? Wasting time? I'm offended. When have I ever... Um, I don't know if we want to mention Kuno's dad because we did give the drugs to Kuno. So mentioning one would probably lead to another. So maybe we shouldn't mention that. So what do you say? Want to take this hot shit back? I don't want to, but you discovered a new species and solved the murder. He shrugs. So I have to. Jude? Anything that ends the trial is okay with me. A quick nod. Agreed. The public relations potential of this is too valuable to let go. Okay. We have vehicles in the square, and the perpetrator needs to be taken into custody. Let's go. Now. Now you will finally get to know who you are. Wait. I have a few questions before we go about who I am. The man looks westward, impatiently, jingling his car keys in his pocket. Who am I? Who are you? You're a gym teacher, Harry. What? Well, obviously you're not a gym teacher anymore, but... But before? Before you were a cop, you were a gym teacher in Cohon. It's getting really cold outside. Should we maybe... Wow. It's funny because gym teacher is always the least cool, coolest job possible. But I guess, make, I guess it does make sense that we're such a physical beast. Was I a guerrilla soldier slash dim gym teacher? No, a regular one. No way. I was a rock and roll singer, right? You haven't told us about that. 
You just told us about being a gym teacher. Well, I guess that does explain a lot. Harry, it explains everything. The running around, the jumping, the bicep girth, your inexplicable facial hair. Yeah, especially the bicep girth. Does, there, does anyone want a gun show? Take the jacket off and so show the guns? No? The collection of fallen sportswear I've amassed. The fact that you don't seem to know what homosexuality is and how you're able to perform a 360 degree spin kick too. Yeah, it's all related. All these things. Also, this guy. Just everything about this guy. God, even this javelin throwing freak here. Oh God, contact Mike. Of course, contact Mike. He's been on about Mike again. I hate that guy. <laughs> Contact Mike is a reprise of the most inspiring basic sporting principle of open competition. A 5,000 5, I rank outsider. 5,000 to 1 rank outsider. Oh, you don't say. Does he also vault an impassable gulf of finance and privilege? He does. How did you know? It is, it is getting cold out. She looks around at the dilapidated fishing village. When was this? When was I a gym teacher? In your 20s or late 20s. You've really let yourself go since then. You said in Koran? I was a gym teacher there? Yes, you tell gym in Koran. I believe that's the term. Tell gym at a high school. You were a high school gym teacher. The smell of sweat and glue. The worn floorboards. Kuro is just east of Jamro. It was a short walk every morning to the baseball field or the sports building. Uh, well, were we happy as a gym teacher? High school. Harry, your goings on with Kuno, Andre, Asel, the whole thing on the ice. That's why you are so juvie. I relate to the teens. His smirk suggests barely contained laughter. Why did I join the RCM then? The regular. You found some chick. She inspired you to fight the big fight. Be more than you are. All that. You. Every morning, walking from Voyager Road to teach Jim. She. Leaving for the academy with her spring coat on. The air filled with the smell of smoke and raspberries. And incredible hope. An ocean full of hope. We tried to be something more than what we were for her. Well, I see now. I knew it. I knew no normal human being can run like that. He's an honest to God gym teacher. Why am I like this? It's not a mystery. Some chick fucked you over. Also, you were drunk. But I mean, that happens to a lot of people, but not like this. You really went with it too. Really maximized the damage. We did. Was she called Dora Dubois? Dubois? It was Dora Ingerlund. I think. You've said her name. But you weren't married. You were engaged. So we weren't even married. No one is married anymore. This is Revachol. When was this? God, I don't know. Six years ago? She was way before my time. We broke up six years ago? Jesus, Harry. <laughs> six years and you haven't gotten over it? What the hell is wrong with you? Six years? No, it was six, like ancient. It's an old man thing. Two old years equals one normal year. That and Dora Ingerlund really tore you a new one, a big one. Who was she? Incredibly bangable. No, no, I mean, what did she do? She was incredibly fuckable. A beautiful bourgeois woman. Wayfish, like a welkin, basically. I mean, I don't think that's really what we're asking. Snow Welkin, Blonde Welkin, Heartbreak Welkin, Pain Welkin. I've only seen a picture, but it's obvious you formed a real spiritual connection with how pretty she was. One you never recuperated from. Look, the sun is going down. It's time to go home. I think she taught in the Académie des Arts, east of the river. Way east. Hard to say which came first. The middle class chick or the drink. Egg and the chicken kind of thing. My point is, you need to see a psychiatrist about this shit. 
Not a psychologist. Several degrees harder. Is there something harder than a psychiatrist? A forensic psychiatrist? Go talk to that. Well, what, did I what did I need to be dead for a forensic psychiatrist to take my case? Precinct 41. What kind of station is it? Us? We're the bloody murder station. Haven't you heard? We're the bad guys. No one likes us. That's not true. Jamrock is too big for one precinct. You are just understaffed. And everyone respects the 41st. You have Captain Price. Thank you, Lieutenant. You're being kind. It is an understaffed station, and the district is too big. Which is why we need to... He tilts his head northward. Get back to it. We left Torsen and McLean to run the Sea Wing. It's not good. Torsen and McLean? Mac the Torso Torsen and Chester McLean. They're not fit to run a wing. Believe me. Things are shaky as it is. They are damn iconic, though. Torsen and McLean. An iconic duo, I take it? Yeah, not like us. Two clinically depressed old men. Where's the contrast here? We're garbage. And the Sea Wing is... God, there are four wings, Harry. A, B, C, and D. We're in C. It's made of losers and clock punchers. You and I reconceptualize it as a task force. It was a mistake. There's also a lot of outside help involved. Not only me, other losers too. And Price is... Ptolemy Price? He's the son of the old Price, one of the founders of the RCM. He's one of the most highly regarded men in the force. You're lucky. Somewhere under the curved roof of a former silk factory shaped like a ladybird with two chimneys, police captain Ptolemy Price sits behind a heavy wooden desk. Resident medic Nix Gottlieb pours him coffee. It's silent in the captain's office. They speak of change, the city, the tension on the streets. They speak of the events of April and the blood on the streets in May. Did we recently shoot up a church by any chance? Because when we first went in the church, there was, I think that there was some conversation that maybe the uh, the RCM shot up some people and some sort of raid gone wrong or something like that. That was a while ago that that was mentioned. So he remembers that. Yes, there may have been a raid on some churches. It was in good press. Shooting up churches never is. I was out of town, to be clear. What happened? Why did we need to go there? Our enemies were hiding in a church, to the best of our information. That's it. I'm not talking about this anymore. Your security clearance is shit tier right now. You have to wait for it to go up. He means it. The RCM and its enemies will not be discussed on this coast. Your clearance will not go up while you're within airshot of the Union headquarters. So I work in the bloody murder station? Okay, it's not the bloody murder station. It's an old converted silk mill with green desk lamps and coffee corner. A lot of good people work there, hard, every day. Jamrock is the largest ghetto in Rivershall. Faubourg, technically, but uh, it's divided into 11 districts. Jamrock only has us. The press will blow over. Jamrock is lucky to have you, and it's often considered to be the greatest of the districts. You're lucky to have it. Thank you again, Lieutenant. This Phasmid. I need to tell Lena about this ASAP. Who is Lena? She lives at 1113 Tabernacle Road in Jamrock. Remember? I do remember. A cryptozoologist. She lives on Jamrock on Tabernacle Road. She told me about the Phasmid. Tabernacle? It's on the way over. Near where you live on Perdition. We ha we live somewhere? So we are really we're really not a hobo cop. She looks at Vic Mare. Fine, if we're gonna drop you off anyway. She and her husband were conducting the search for the Phasmid. It's their discovery, in part. They should know as soon as possible. It would do you good to deliver some positive news for a change. Lieutenant Kitsuragi, what will you do now? Well, first I will go back to my station and write the most detailed report anyone has ever seen. It will have to be good to cover all this. Then I will have a serious talk with my captain. About what? Detective, we just stopped a small-scale war. Something is happening to Revachol. He pulls up his collar and looks around, the cold spring light reflected in the lenses of his glasses. 
I don't know what yet, but it's going to be a hard spring for the RCM. We need to get ready, infiltrate, investigate. Distant traffic. A scrap of newspaper drifts by, carried by the wind. It says, tensions rise in Terminal YC in light of the Debardeur's strike in Terminal B, among representatives of every industry in Coal City. You read. It's spreading. Want to do that at Station 41? Talk to Captain Price? I'd rather not ruffle the feathers of two captains with my doom mongering. No, I mean investigate. Come work in Precinct 41. Work with Price? I'm flattered, but I don't know if I... Would fit him. I'm crazy enough. Can take the stress. He doesn't know how to finish the sentence. Flattered? You're yet no Kitsuragi. We would be flattered if you even considered. I would have to tie things up in GRIH first. But, I mean, whatever is coming, Jamrock will be more central to it than the harbor. The lieutenant turns very serious all of a sudden. And we also have a huge caseload, Lieutenant. Piles that we need to get back to. Mountains, even. I do like the sound of that. He returns her smile. I'm ready. Good. She looks at you, then Vic Mare. Fuck it. Let's go. Tron brought his motor carriage. It's a 20 minute drive to Jam Rock. Under the evening sky, the great district turns on its lights. A chessboard of wooden houses, 80,000 living souls inside. Fire traps as far as the eye can see, from Main Street to Precinct 41 atop the motorway, to Boogie Street disappearing into the rain on the horizon. You close your eyes and hear the dogs bark. A lone woman sits by a factory window, dreaming of meteorite strikes. On Rue de Saint-Jerome, a square bullet slides into a square-shaped chamber. In Old South, a man without eyelids smiles. Spring has come. It's time. Square bullets. Dawson? Yes. McLean? Yes. Heidelstan? No. Vicmere? Yes. Dubois? Of course. Really? Nick Scottleep looks up from the list. I hear he's unstable. You say that like it's a bad thing. Captain Ptolemy Price gestures with a ballpoint pen. It's dim in his office and the curtains are drawn. Harry's our man. He'll pull through. When he does, he'll side with the people. Understood. Gottlieb returns to the list. Minna, of course. Wonderful. Then can we please just go back to Jamrock now? A little applause there. As Disco Elysium, well, it's ended now. And the credits are rolling. Well, of course, I assume that certain things could go in some different ways. But this is the way how our playthrough went. We found the murderer. We found the phasmid. We, uh, well, we, were, we killed the mercenaries, but... Of course, we were not able to keep all of the Hardys from being killed. 
In the end, Kim really trusted us. And we were a huge superstar communist. We also sang karaoke, though it was the failure karaoke, which uh, after looking at what the success karaoke was, I'm glad that we got the failure. That was a much, uh, much more heart rending version of the song. That is a lot of voices by Mikey W. Goodman. Very hard to exploit handicapped person? I'm not sure if we encountered that person.
with how many names are in the credits for things like translating and proofreading. You think about just reviewing this massive tome of a script. Thanks to Ziggy for the stress relief. And that is our playthrough of Disco Elysium. There can be, I assume, many different kinds of playthroughs, but this was ours. And I think that uh, going with the a Bully Demise-inspired build was a good way to go. Although, of course, the way we ended up playing it ended up differing quite a bit because of, you know, just the way things went, the way dialogue went, and the way the investigation went. And that is the that's some good role-playing, I think, when the character just goes in places that you might not expect it. This is a, an unusual kind of game for me to play because I never really played the old uh, CRPGs or uh, Planescape Torment, which was a big inspiration for this one. But uh, I found this game really engaging all the way through, even though it's fairly slow paced, a lot of walking around, a lot of talking and conversation. Um, I found the whole thing just really interesting and just kept my attention the whole time through each of these streams for however many hours that might be. I probably should tally up how many hours it took to play through this. Um, because I never felt that it was got, it got boring or old at all um, through the whole time. And it's kind of funny because the map is pretty small. If you think about it, it's there's really not that much landmass, not that many pl uh, places to go or people to talk to, but the conversations are so good and can be so big and so in-depth that uh, it felt a lot bigger than it actually was. Also, I feel pretty confident in saying that this game has the best writing that I've ever seen in a video game. Granted, for compared to some video games, that's not exactly a high bar. But there are games that have really good writing, but I think this one has to be number one when it comes to writing. Um, don't know if I would have gotten as much out of it if it was the original version. I do think the additional voice acting really did help. Um, the narrator voice for the thoughts was really good and really delivered that dry humor that the writing was getting across. Um, interesting 
I'm just thinking about the conclusion of it, and I thought it was interesting about how when you get to the conclusion, it does something that generally you would think is a bad idea for a mystery game in that the culprit ends up being someone who never showed up in the game but previously to that. And usually you would think that's not something you want to do in a mystery. And the main thing that came to my mind when thinking about that was another game that did something similar, uh, that being Zero Time Dilemma. Ever since playing that game, the idea of the old man in the wheelchair who's been off screen for the whole game has been kind of a running joke with me. Uh, and this, but this game did, in fact, have an old game, an old man who was off screen for the entire game. Yet it worked. I thought it worked very well here and worked terribly in Zero Time Dilemma. And I was trying to think about why that is. And, uh, I guess it's just because, in the end, the story becomes a whole lot more about about than just the murder mystery. It becomes about the town itself, the society, the history of this world, the overarching conflict between the Union and Wild Pines, which is the main conflict that you're seeing throughout the game. The, um, the states that people are in, the sort of desires they have and the depression that they're in. Everyone's all kind of sad in Martinez. Just various levels of sadness. Some people holding it together more than others. Um, and compared to a lot of it, the murder mystery really doesn't seem that important as you continue on. Uh, rather the mystery of Harry himself, who he is and why is he, why is he like this becomes a much bigger part of the game. I said that after we did the tribunal, that felt like the climax of the game. And then everything after that felt like the falling action. Uh, I, yeah, I do feel, I do feel like that, that when we were, when we were on the boat approaching the Island, it kind of felt like this, it was sort of like a feeling of, yeah, we know the killer's on the island. And honestly, it doesn't really matter. Because if you think about it, who cares by that point? Who cares about the villain? The only people who love... Uh, not the villain, I should say. Well, yes, a villain. The, the person who was killed, the mercenary. I meant to say victim, but it came out villain because he was a villain, as we know. He was a murderer and rapist. Um, even if he may not have done those things in Martinez. But was there anyone who actually cared about the villain, who loved the villain, who would have cared about if the uh, killer was caught? There were the merc other mercenaries, and we killed them. So by the end of the game, does anyone even care about who the actual killer is? I mean, no, no one in Martinez does. Everyone in Martinez probably feels like it was a good thing that that guy was killed because, well, he's like this crazy mercenary who came in from Wild Pines coming into, uh, coming into Martinez. Who would we even tell? Tell Everard? Well, we can't talk to Everard by that point, but we find out that Everard probably knew that Edgar and Everard knew that about the deserter on the island and employed his services at one point. So Everard probably knew the whole time that it was likely that the deserter killed the mercenary since he knew he was there. He didn't tell us about him, but he probably would not be surprised to find out that, that that's who did it. And it's not like he would do anything about it. It's not like he would punish the guy or anything. So the town itself doesn't care who killed this guy. The victim's loved ones don't care because they're dead now. Um, really, the only people who care are Harry and Kim themselves. They're the only ones who are doggedly pursuing this case to try to find out who killed the guy. And really... It's really more Harry because it turns out that solving the case is for Harry, really. Harry really needs this as we find out details here and there about his life and what's been happening to him and why he's this way. We find out that Harry really needs to succeed at this. He needs to not screw this up. Just he needs to not screw up this one thing. So 
solving the case and finding the killer, it's not really about justice. It's not really about a shocking revelation of who the killer is. It's just Harry needs to win just something. And so when you get on, go onto the island, when you find the deserter and he's sitting there with his rifle, you don't know who it is, but you know this is the guy. And you know you've reached the end of your journey. The only person, the only people who care are Harry and Kim. And at least this did come through for Harry in the final con in the final conversation with John. Uh, I, I think that that probably would have gone a whole lot worse if we had not been able to solve the case or get the confession from the killer. Um, so they're going back to the station. They're going to arrest the deserter. And uh, from there... I don't know what from there, because really, no one involved with that murder, no one involved with the case, no one actually cares. Crinell probably doesn't care, because the mercenaries attempted to form a tribunal without the company's authorization. They were going to kill a whole bunch of people, so Crinell is probably dis dis you know, dis disassociating themselves with them. So all this time we were spending all this time trying to find the murderer of someone that no one cares about. And probably no one cares about that person for some good reason. Um, I felt that it seems somehow fitting that the culprit was someone who had, we had never met before. It wasn't some shocking twist. It was just, here's an old man full of hatred. And he just decided to shoot the guy with through his rifle one day. Did he have any big reason? No. He just hated him. He hated everything. We've been learning about communism throughout the game, about the old revolution, the communards, who had actually achieved their dream. They had overthrew, they overthrew the monarchy and were able to establish their commune. You know, as far as what was life under that commune like, you know, you get some... You know, you get some different accounts. Uh, but from the deserter's point of view, they did it. They achieved the dream. They made their their little paradise. And what happened? But the rest of the world joined forces to crush them and wipe them out from the earth and never rebuild Martinez as a constant reminder to people of what would happen if they tried that again. And you have this guy, this old man, whose world had been shaped by his dream being utterly, utterly crushed in every possible way something could be crushed. Sitting on this island, living as basically a hobo for decades. Just hating everyone and everything around him. And he just decided to shoot a mercenary one day. And really, there was no big plan, no malicious plot. The plan it was it really didn't have anything to do with these conflict between Wild Pines and the Union. It was just an old man full of hatred. And it seems somehow fitting. It also seems somehow fitting that once we knew, once we found out that the deserter killed the former head of the Union... That didn't really matter either, because what could anyone do at that point? Joyce herself said that if they, if Wild Pines wanted to do something about the uh, the Clares, they needed to do it years ago. It was it was much too late now. Now, even if we were able to prove that the Clares had the deserter kill the old head of the Union, I mean, what would happen? The Clares run Martinez, who's going to arrest them. Everyone in Martinet seems to like Everard. They've mentioned that Everard's a scumbag, but he's their scumbag. So there's really nothing that we would be able to do. The RCM never even had a real authority in, uh, in Martinez. So we're able to solve the case, and it's a victory for Harry. But in the end, it doesn't really matter. As, and that really fits the, the tone of the game. As life life goes on, and a lot of what people do end up not really mattering in the long run. And even if you do 
succeed, even if you do get that victory, it could be that those airships and gunships off the coast are going to start firing, which we don't really know whatever what the Claire's intend to plan for that. We did see that newspaper at the end that indicated that another uh, another union was following in the footsteps of this one. And it seemed like there might be uh, the whole idea of the union going unions going into business for themselves, going to war with the company that might be catching on. And if it does, all that means is that those coalition ships are going to start firing again. So how, how do they deal with that? We won't know. Because that's some time in the future of this world. Not now, not the present. And that's too that's too big for Harry and Kim to deal with anyway. They're de they deal with much smaller things. They deal with a murder mystery. They found an undiscoverable insect. They helped out some people here and there. They told that one woman what happened to her husband. Her husband accidentally died. And at least she got some closure that way. We helped out Kuno a little bit. I mean, that's... I mean, my understanding is that if Kim gets shot, you can get Kuno as your assistant. And that if that happens, the ending can be Kuno leaving with Harry at the end of the game. I don't know if Harry adopts him or what, which is kind of an interesting idea that that is a path that can happen. You're not going to get it if you if Kim does stay with you. But uh, the idea that that is how Kuno's story can end is very interesting. Harry does try to help people uh, in what, what little ways he can. And I guess that's all you can really do is try to help people in what little ways you can. The, the big stuff, the union fighting the company, that's really above you and if you try to get involved in that all that's probably going to happen is you're going to get manipulated by a mob boss who knows how to play you knows how to push your buttons get you to do what he wants even though you thought you were doing what was right we also tried to do as many side stuff as much side stuff as possible which, I mean, I assume that if you don't do that, this game could go a lot faster. Like, what, what do you actually need to do to solve the case? You need to talk to the Hardys, then have that, like, conversation with the Hardys, then Klaustia, then Hardys, then Klaustia, back and forth until they mention Ruby, who went to the coast. And then on Wednesday, you can close the water gate to get to the coast and find her in the building. Like, if if your points are high enough to succeed at those roles, I guess that's all you really need to do. Then after Ruby, you go back for the tribunal. I guess. But most likely, like, if you weren't doing any, anything else, I assume that your points, your stats would not be high enough to actually get those roles. Like the godly authority role we needed to make against Titus. And, uh, I mean, there are just things that we didn't need to do, but that we wanted to do. Like, the most important one to me was the, uh, the Insulindian Phasmid quest. And, uh, that one seemed like it was going to end in disappointment. And, uh, I really liked how they brought it back right at the end there, in a very, at a very unexpected time. Like, at that point, you're not thinking about the Phasmid anymore. At that point... You think it's all over, and then all of a sudden the reeds move and stand up. And did the conversation with the Phasmid actually happen? We got that conversation because we succeeded at an Inland Empire role, so... Did we just imagine the conversation? Or, did, I mean, we like to think that we actually had the conversation. But how much of what Harry experiences is real, and how much is him just being just insane is difficult to say and then of course we became just a full-blown communist so much communism oozing out of every pore and of course people do say that 
after playing the game, you should play it again uh, with different stats. I can imagine how different that could be. In this playthrough, we had high Fizz. Our second highest was Psyche. Uh, and Moat and Int were very low. But I imagine that if you, like, if you did that the opposite way around, uh, you would be getting very different information from your stats. And you would also be at risk of, of dying very easily as well. Because for us, like, it took a lot to actually hurt us physically. We had so much fizz. Game does a very good job at making the characters endearing to you. Like, <clears throat> something, um, just sort of as an aside, something that strikes me about this is a frequent criticism I'll hear of, you know, media, you know, video games, movies, literature, whatever, is how tropey they are, how many cliches they have. I never really like that criticism because cliches can be done well. And when you think about the premise of Disco Elysium, the premise is that you're playing a mentally ill detective who is an alcoholic. He's lost his memory and he's real wacky. And you're paired up with a straight laced uh, detective who just does not like your antics. And the two of you got to get together and solve the murder case. That sounds extremely uninspired uh, if you just say it like that. But this game just executed that so well just very well like it this the premise just would not work so well if the writing wasn't as good if your wackiness wasn't as funny as it is and if kim wasn't as likable a character as he is um i feel it was just like an excellent execution of these particular tropes um it's also an interesting game in how it talks about communism being that this is a game made in estonia and they have you know they the developers would have a different view of communism and capitalism and different modes of governance and the idea of a big unstoppable military force who maybe comes in from the outside to tell you that this is how things are going to be now and don't worry, it's going to be real great under us. And maybe that hap maybe that happens to you more than once in your history. And maybe your life doesn't, maybe life the life doesn't really change that much for the small people. It's an interesting perspective that I don't think you would be able to be, you wouldn't be able to get it from a Western-made game. Hmm. Not sure. What else I would say about Disco Elysium at this point? Uh, like I said, just an excellent, excellent story. Excellent characters. Excellent writing. Um, and I just had a really good time playing the whole thing and was very, in, uh, was very engaged by the story and the dialogue. And uh, even just like the graphic style and the music. Like the graphics are simple. But it, it is a very look good looking game, I think. It, it makes it does a lot with its art style. The music is pretty much generally all really good. Like I really like that scene when we were going to the island and there was like a slow, mournful cover of Disco Inferno. What? But it worked really well. Um, it just feels like there is an extremely strong vision among the developers who made this very high conceptualization stats with the developers and it just came, it just all came together really well in a way that I never really see in a game. Um, it's just everything feels like it came out as well as it possibly could have. In you know, there are some games where I might say this is this game is like a jewel in the rough, 
Like, there are parts I really like and parts that I think are really rough. Like, you know, one example would be Deadly Premonition. I really like the characters in that. I like the dialogue. But, of course, there are very rough uh, areas of that game, such as, you know, combat or technical aspects. Um, this game, there really isn't anything about it that I would say is rough or could have done better or anything like that. It just is all a very complete unified vision that came through exceedingly well. Um, I don't think it's that controversial to say that Disco Elysium is probably and will probably will be an all-time classic. So, I don't think I have anything else to say about it. This has been our playthrough for Disco Elysium. I hope that you've enjoyed watching this lengthy playthrough. I'm sorry, I should say I hope you enjoyed watching this very uh, efficient playthrough. Uh, this speed run of the game I, as I played through it as uh, efficiently and as quickly as we possibly could have. Don't want to waste your time or anything. Hope you had a good time with Disco and Raphael and Kim.